I'm here to talk about something really simple. And I'll start by talking about trust. Because something profound is happening in the world of technology that may have the solutions to India's biggest problems. And we'll start with a few simple questions for all of you. Please raise your hands if you've ever been on an airplane. OK, fair amount. If you knew that the, uh, that the pilot flying the airplane didn't know how to fly, would you still take that flight? Fair enough. How many of you look for reviews when buying something online? It's really great deal. Okay. Would you be OK with sending money online to a stranger? Please raise your hands. I think the point is made. Trust is something that we seek when we interact and transact with one another. But trust is also about a lot more. Trust is the grease that allows our economic and political machines to function. For instance, we trust our democratic institutions to hold a free and fair election. It's what enabled the previous Indian general election to be the biggest democratic exercise in human history. We trust our lawmakers and our judiciary to uphold the rule of law. Then there are other institutions such as banks and corporations that we rely on for a multitude of things. So suffice it to say then, we depend on institutions for our most basic needs, our rights, our education, our health, our physical safety, our prosperity, and the future are completely placed in the hands of our institutions. Suffice it to say also then that the cause for a lot of problems that we face in India today should be attributed to institutions. A multitude of factors have compromised our institutions and undermined our trust in them. What are those causes? I think we can debate all we want, but there is one rampant disease that I think all of us agree contributes to this more than anything else. I'm speaking, of course, about corruption. India, in the Transparency International Index, ranks 79. That's an abysmally low number. And just to give you some context, the lower the number, the, most, the more corrupt the country is. In a recent World Economic Forum survey, 50% of young Indians said that corruption contributes most to India's problems. The upside, though, is that we are willing to do what it takes to fight with corruption. And this was evident when, in November of previous year, our prime minister gave us a pleasant surprise and said that 14 trillion rupees would be demonetized. We didn't go riding in the streets like we do when India wins the World Cup. What we did, we came together as a country and supported the intention behind that move. So that's the good thing. Even if you don't believe the statistics behind uh, corruption, I think it's evident to all of us that the social and political landscape has been dominated by moral outrage over corruption. So we're really angry about corruption, and we're willing to do what it takes to eliminate it. So why is it corruption still so dominant? And what no new innovative ways can we find to deal with it? A popular opinion has been that technology holds the solutions to corruption. This is because we feel that through the use of technology, we can eliminate middlemen. And since the human element is to blame for corruption, technology may bring about some change. Someone said that the average person today has more power in their hands than the US president did two decades ago. That's right, all of you. In an information sense, you have more power than the US president did about two decades ago. And it is this immense power that fuels the opinion that technology can bring about change. But even with the massive impact that technology has had on our lives and the way we've come to depend on it for a variety of things, there's been a fundamental missing element of internet-based technologies. 
You see, the technology of internet has evolved over the previous three decades or so, and it evolved in layers. With each layer, new functionality was introduced. We found new ways of using the internet, and also with each layer, the internet became more secure. However, one element was missing. That is the layer of trust. Now, the causes for that are the way we have structured our society. For centuries, we've held on to this idea that institutions such as governments, banks, and corporations are centralized. What centralized means is that the authority and power is in the hands of a few. Why is that a problem? Well, if power is concentrated in a few hands and there is lack of transparency, the system can be cheated and manipulated to serve the interest of those who are in power. Where we went wrong when developing technologies and solutions to interact in our economic and political systems was that we mirrored our technologies to match the structure. Our structure still dominates where power rests in the hand of whoever controls the technology. Our legal identities, ownership of assets, government records, these are all highly centralized. So when you think of centralized power on one hand and lack of transparency on the other, it isn't difficult to see why technology hasn't been able to solve corruption. But what if that could change? What if there was a technology that could give us that missing trust layer of the internet? What if there was a technology by using which organizations and institutions could be more transparent, secure, and efficient? That technology now exists and is called the blockchain. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may haven't. Blockchain, not the most grandiose sounding word, is it? Well, neither is the technology behind uh, blockchain. But what I'm hoping for you to do today is not get behind the intricacies of blockchain, but understand how it's different from the existing structure and what we can do with it. Blockchain evolved during the 2008 financial crash. It was invented by a guy or a group, we don't know because the identity is anonymous, called Satoshi Nakamoto. Blockchain at its core is just a record of transactions. Transactions can be anything of value. It could be money, it could be assets, it could be legal documents, or even votes. So the next question that obviously comes to mind is how is that different? Record, system, uh, record keeping systems have been existing since civilizations. Well, the difference is blockchain is a decentralized and distributed online database that anyone with an inner connection, internet connection can be part of. Unlike a traditional database, which is controlled by, let's say, a government or a company, the blockchain isn't owned by anyone. Who owns it then? All of you. Millions and millions of users who are part of the network own the blockchain. And all of you can help run the blockchain and you own the information. Transactions made on a blockchain aren't stored in one single source, but across a network of millions of computers. Users who are part of the network use their own computers to store bundles of information. These bundles can be referred to as blocks. What each block basically is, is a collection of transactions that were made in a specified time frame. So, to take one popular blockchain as an example, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, every block contains the transactions that happened in the previous 10 minutes. In addition to this, each block that was created has a timestamp and a link to the previous block of information. And all of these blocks are secured by the highest form of cryptography. So that's what it is. That's what the blockchain is. It's secure, it's transparent, and it's decentralized. And basically, any government function or economic 
function that is based on the blockchain would follow these characteristics. So if you think about how this can be used for the Indian story, think now of government spending and budgets being based on the blockchain. Every single public rupee that is spent would be open to scrutiny. All of us here would be able to look at how much money was spent, what it was spent on, and when it was spent. And all these records cannot be manipulated because they're timestamped and secured by cryptography. Corruption isn't the only aspect that blockchain can address. There's about 2.5 billion people here in the world who don't have bank accounts. When you consider the implications on India, if you take the number of Indian citizens who don't have bank accounts, it would be the eighth largest country in the world. Because these people don't have bank accounts, they are unable to participate in the global economy. They don't have bank accounts, they cannot avail financial services, they cannot get loans. Simple cell phone apps are now being used to give these people economic identities so they can be part of the global economy. So we just saw that blockchain can also be a catalyst for financial inclusion. But it doesn't stop there. Much has been spoken about the ease of doing business in India. There's these things called smart contracts which are based on the blockchain technology. Individual businesses can transact and carry out business functions without the involvement of a third party. Another area is land registration, which is archaic and inefficient and rife with corruption. If we could base our land registration and real estate on the blockchain, it would be a big boost to the economy and would also give property owners confidence around the ownership. Blockchain can impact democracy itself. How many of you here vote? Can you please raise your hands? Are all of you certain that the vote that you casted went to the person that you intended it to? Is there any way for you to find out? Well, blockchain can do that for us. Because a voting system based on the blockchain would be able to give you exactly who you voted for when you voted and those records cannot be manipulated by any government agency. Simply put, the blockchain can transform the way we understand governance. But with any other revolutionary technology, the issue is with the rate of adoption, as well as the resistance to change. Blockchain, the way it's designed, is fighting against very old standing structures of power. And that's where all of us are coming. We need to establish a will to study how this technology could impact all of our lives. We, as Indians, have been born into a country where the institutions were created for us. We didn't have to fight for them. Then, we should take it upon us to look for new ways where we could establish trust back into our institutions. Thank you.